السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم صل وسلم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وعملا اللهم نور قلوبنا بعلمك واستعمل أبداننا لطاعتك ووفقنا لما تحب وترضى من القول والعمل والفعل والنية والهداء إنك على كل شيء قدير يا وهاب يا وهاب يا وهاب يا فتاح يا فتاح يا فتاح يا جبار يا جبار يا جبار أما بعد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى الأخلاء يوم إذ بعضهم لبعض عدون إلى المتقين يا عبادي لا خوف عليكم اليوم ولا أنتم تحزنون صدق الله العظيم Brothers and sisters and online listeners and on-site listeners, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, again, I, I reward all of you for your patience. I know many of you, subhanAllah, patiently doing a list waiting here or at home. And inshallah, this is regard as ibadah. Hopefully you're doing a dhikr and staying busy. Every night, alhamdulillah, I have different programs, different masajids. So coming back from those programs, I just came back a couple minutes ago. So this, this can sometimes gets us a little bit delayed in starting the program. But nonetheless, this is very heartwarming to always see all of you waiting. And this talab and this desire is going to get you really far, inshaAllah. Just simply showing Allah that you want Him. Right? Showing Allah that I'm going to wait for you. I'm going to knock on your door. Why are you here? You're here for Allah. You're in Allah's house. Of course you're here for Allah. So this is a very beautiful thing to show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, so today, uh, we have an interesting topic. Um, and, uh, but more than the topic, I have a very interesting co-panelist. MashaAllah. So I heal, I'll let him introduce the topic. I'm sorry, I'll let him, yes. I'll let him introduce the topic while I introduce him. So MashaAllah, this is my very good childhood friend, um, Ahmad Sharif, Alhamdulillah, Dr. Ahmad Sharif. And um, the verse today, it's, it's called, uh, the topic, bro, you're becoming too religious, is the topic, right? So what exactly is that supposed to mean? I'll let him explain it. But I know one chunk of it is about friendship, correct? It's something to do with friendship. So it's so interesting. As I just started reading the verse, I just came up here and said, let me read a verse. Wallahi, so I just, I said, what should I read? And the first thing that just came out of my tongue was, Friends will be for each other. Friends on that day will be, will be enemies of one another on the day of judgment. Except for those who have taqwa. So I was thinking about our relationship. And then subhanAllah, I saw the topic is the same thing too. So this is such an apt ayah to discuss. That alhamdulillah, this friendship is from fourth grade between us. And alhamdulillah from what, 1994. We went to same same class together here at CPSA for four years together. And then I went on to South Africa in eighth grade in 1998. And Ahmad joined um, in 99, right? 99, mashallah. And he completed his Hafid al Quran there. And mashallah, in a very speedy Gonzales speed, you know, mashallah, real quick and really benefited. Came back, alhamdulillah, finished his college and um, completed his medicine. And if he has, mashallah, he works as a physician. So, and, um, and so he's doing atikaf here this year. He had his two sons um, earlier and who, Masha went back now. But uh, so we decided that this topic would be great to have um, him along with, uh, with me tonight to discuss a topic of friendship. And this is the beauty, honestly, of friendship that's inshallah, inshallah, inshallah for the sake of Allah, that decades can, decades can go by, years can go by, and you just start off where you left off. When I go to Africa too, you know, once in a while, I see friends I haven't seen for 15 years. So I was in England uh, this past summer. I met, I met uh, classmates and friends from Dar al who I haven't meet and met for like 20 years. But it's amazing when that relationship is like not materialistic, when you meet people, it just goes right back to where it was 20 years ago. It's like you literally can answer a question that, that was asked, you know, 20 years ago. Um, scrambled, what was it? You remember the joke you used to always say about the Indian? How was your eggs? Yeah. Do you remember that? <laughs> See, literally, I remember the joke from the, from the 90s that he told me. SubhanAllah. So, <laughs> so this is, uh, this is uh, the, uh, yani something which we should all ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, which is to have good company. Good company in every stage of your life. And uh, that will help you grow in your deen and dunya. Once you have a good friend, that will last the whole life. And Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, that's why he said, عَلَيْكَ بِالْخَلِيلِ الصَّادِقِ بِالْخَلِيلِ الصَّالِحِ وَقَلَّمَا تَجِدْهُ He said, hold on to a pious friend. If you find a person who wants to be your friend and is pious, hold on to him, grab him. Okay? Then, وَقَلَّمَا تَجِدْهُ And rarely will you find a man like that. He said that hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago that it's very hard to find a genuine person who you can befriend and who is actually genuinely also God-fearing and pious. 
And if you find one of those things, then grab them. Because that is one of the most amazing gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you. Enough said as an introduction, inshallah. We can go ahead and uh, start the topic. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, I think one thing that Mufti Azimuddin left out when he was talking about uh, how I ended up memorizing Quran was that, you know, back in the day there were a few hafaz, but nothing like it is now, right? It wasn't that common. Um, so in my school, in the entire school, maybe there were two hafaz at that time? Mufti Azimuddin and Mufti Minhajuddin. And then maybe a couple others. But it was not like it is now where people are going constantly. So... Once we had exposure to him, it opened up a whole new world for us. And when he left for South Africa, it inspired multiple people to go memorize Quran, mashallah. So he essentially gets a share in the reward of everybody who memorized after him. And I'm sure a lot of them went on to go teach, right? So he gets a share of reward from that. So inshallah, it'll just keep on going through time, inshallah. Um, yeah, so... Speaking of muttaqi friends, right? Alhamdulillah, inshallah. Inshallah. Uh, the topic today is, uh, bro, you're becoming too religious. I think probably most of the people here are going to hear that at some point, if they, inshallah, go down that path. Uh, so for you specifically, I would think that your definition of becoming religious is different when, in, if when other people say you're becoming too religious. So what does it mean to you to become too religious and what do you think it means to other people when they say you're becoming too religious? Okay, so if someone says it to me, yeah, what do you yeah. Um, Okay, so I, I actually, I, huh? not if someone says it to you, but what do you think of the concept of becoming too religious? Because do you think it's a positive thing? Do you think it's a negative thing? When well, other it, people, it, it depends, of course, on the context. Who's saying it? Um, religious man is such a vague word. Yeah, it's a loaded term. It means so good and bad yeah. because the, the whole religious fanaticism, which has nothing to do with the deen, mm. is a big, it is a problem, not too big of a problem, but it happens. And uh, you know, they say in madrasa, they say, Bhai khushki mat bano. Yeah. You remember that? Right. Uh, khushki basically means someone, they say, he's done, so much, he's done so much zikr and whatnot that he's now his head has become, they say, dry. Yeah. He doesn't put tail, he doesn't put oil on his head. Now, you see, now he's doing crazy things. So there, there was a concept where some people would just become so linear in their thinking. It's black and white. Everything's black and white. And they, be, they want to write, give fatwas against their own teachers. Yeah. Right? We've seen that. And they, it's, it's everything is myself versus the world and everyone got it wrong except for me. It's, it is a, that type of um, extremism exists and it is nothing to do with Islam. It literally has to do with the psychology of that person. If you were to be going to Christianity, Judaism, or Islam, or anything else, Satanism, he'd be like that. Because it's his own mental issue. It's an issue of, of just not being able to see the whole picture and being fixated on small and final details and think that that's everything. So that is something, sometimes I may use that. You know, and speaking about someone like this guy is doing ghulu, becoming extremist in his understanding of the deen. And when you think you know it better than your teachers, you're going to jump ahead of them, that's exactly what that is. Right? There's no khair in that. Um, honestly, so if the uncle, he used to say, "Don't be." Some people are more Christian than the Pope. Man, that's such a nice word, right? You always say it, more Christian than the Pope. And so there's what it is. Some people want to be more more pious than the Prophet I want to be more pious than the than the scholars and their teachers. Then there's another group of people who will say too religious, because it's such a subjective word. Someone who never prays and he sees someone start praying Juma. I've seen that man. Take it easy. We're cultural Muslims. Why are you going all out? Someone who is definitely not wearing a scarf, and she sees he she sees one of her friends starts wearing a scarf. Then they all gang up at times, all against her, and say, so "Why are you becoming so religious?" So for many people, religion means even bringing one main fault in your life is just too much, right? Like just lead your life in a normal cultural manner, and um, identify yourself with Islamic culture without actually doing any act of worship. Right? As soon as you start doing acts of worship, a liquor, salah, sadaqah, fasting, now it's just too religious. So that's, you know, one group of people use it in that sense. Hmm. I'm not sure what else you were looking yeah, for. That's good. Um, These questions, by the way, are not 
I don't know what, what, what I'm going to get asked. So if we take it in the positive sense, where somebody is becoming more connected to Allah, um, and you mentioned that sometimes your friends will you know, say something to that guy last week and now you're religious. So how do you navigate that? How do you approach that? When someone says when that so, to you. When your friends say that to you, you already have an established relationship with them. Right. One thing I forgot to say at the beginning of this majlis, uh, which I do every night, so I just want to, I want to take a moment Go back to that. that. Let us all, inshallah, renew our intention while we're here. We're here for only for the sake of Allah Azza wa Let's make niyyah in artikaf, that we're in the house of Allah in the artikaf. Number three, let us make the niyyah that whatever good we hear, we'll put into practice. And we will, inshallah, try our best to propagate it to others. Number four, let us be as sincere in our supplication to Allah. That, ya Allah, whatever on this night of Ramadan, Friday night here, I'm in the masjid. I could have been anywhere else. You brought me here. Oh Allah, allow me to hear whatever is going to be beneficial. Whether you're listening online or now. I want you to take a moment and sincerely make this dua to Allah. That Ya Allah, whatever is going in my life and what I need to hear, allow it to be discussed. Okay? Everyone did that? Make this dua. And the more sincere you and I are in our dua, this is going to help navigate our conversation and make it fruitful and beneficial. Going back to your question, when someone says, bro, you're becoming too religious, uh, and I saw you there, now you're over here. I saw, I can't believe you were there, and now you're sitting in this bayan lecture over here. What's going on? You know... Take this as a source of tarbiyah, as a means of ensuring that your nafs is under control. Because it's really nice to sit here, front and center, and then whenever he's leaving to sit, mashallah, make a long, you know, tahajjud. And downstairs also, you know, eating suhoor quickly and coming back up. It can, even this, if this is your first night in the masjid, it can happen that it could get to your head. And the person begins to think, truly, I am so pious. But when someone comes and says, look at you, you're there and you're over here. What happens? That brings us down. It brings the nafs down. It hurts the ego. It definitely hurts the nafs. So when we hear these things, let's figure out how we can give it a positive spin. And you should think that I need to hear this. I need to hear this type of things, as hurtful it may be, but it helps me remember who I really am. It's true I was there one week ago. It's true I was sitting last night. It's true I, didn't, I don't usually come here. You're right, thank you for reminding me. But guess what? If it wasn't for the grace of Allah, I would still be there. It is because of Allah that I am sitting here. Thank you for reminding me that I myself am not here because of my own effort. It's Allah who lifted me out of that dirt, lifted me out of that spot, lifted me out of that dark spot in my life and brought me to the deen. So you are saying this to me, not only is it creating humility and humbleness and chiseling at my ego, but it's also making me aware that I must give thanks and gratitude only to Him and not to anyone else. Not even to myself. Not to say like, Shabash, I've done something great. I haven't done anything great. Allah lifted me up from there. If Allah didn't lift me up, I would still continue to doing. So the way to respond to that, man, you're looking too religious. You can just simply say, brother, you know I know. I'm not the best person. I'm trying. And I want you to please pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to give me steadfastness. So you just end it on a, such a positive way. What is the guy going to say to that? Hmm. So if you have that relationship with somebody um, where they're essentially trying to pull you down, right? When you're trying to evolve, uh, then how do you maintain that friendship and that relationship? SubhanAllah. Very good question. Million dollar question. So many of us in Ramadan wanting to change. We're sitting here while our old bunch of friends outside are, are you know, are, are spending it like any other Friday night. Let's just put it like that. So how do, we, how do we navigate that? My dear brothers, Imam Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi, and he talks about in his Bidayatul Hidayah, it's a great book available here, and I teach this in the one-year program as well. It's an amazing book, last book written by Imam Ghazali, Beginning of Guidance. He talks about friendship at the end of the book, and that's where we usually we end our academic year, studying that. And that's like the final classes of the year, is when we talk about the last pages of Bidayatul Hidayah, where he talks about relationships and friendships. And I tell these boys and girls who graduate from the one-year program, we alhamdulillah, you've been here for 11 months. You've grown, mashallah, like a decade worth in one year. But just like this massive change that has come, I want you to understand how did this massive change come? Those brothers in I'tikaf, right? Sunnah I'tikaf, you've been here for four days, five days. And if you're sitting in this talk, I, I have no doubt that you have evolved. I have no doubt there's been a massive change in your thinking. There's been a massive change in your approach to life. I have no doubt. If you sit in the talks during Atikaf, along with doing everything else, inshallah, I'm 100% confident that you're going through a massive change. But that change happened because of what? 
It happened because of the environment you're in. So if, we, if the pendulum can swing from one side to the other, it definitely can swing to the other side as well. If four days of i'tikaf, five days of i'tikaf can take us this way, well then guess what? Spending five days in an environment that is completely against the environment of i'tikaf can of course very quickly take us to the other side. And usually evil spreads quicker than goodness. Right? To build something is much longer than breaking it. It takes quicker to break something than to build it. So I always tell my students that after one year, you're leaving here. Don't sit there feeling confident over what you have achieved and your piety and your God-fearingness and so and so. Remind yourself who you were before you came here. And I promise you when you leave from here, if you do not keep yourself surrounded by the right company, not only will you may go back to where you started, you will actually probably go even worse. Because it's just, why is that? That's an important question. Hold it for me and we'll come back to that. But uh, the, 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 the solution is what then? What's the solution? You cannot just graduate from Atikaf, graduate from Ramadan, graduate from the Tinweer program and say life is going to be back to normal. No, my friends. You have to bite the bullet. And the bullet is I have to go make sure that my group of friends are either already on this wavelength, which probably is not the case. And if that's not the case, then I need to take a break from that group of friends until I reach the level of knowledge, wisdom, spirituality, and experience to be able to make a change. Otherwise, it's like a pack, a pack of 10 versus 1. You are all, mashallah, pumped up. But guess what? You're faced with nine other guys or girls who are pumped up on the opposite side. And so the chance of survival against nine people is, is tough. They say a simple rule that if you see a guy drowning and you don't know how to swim, call someone for help instead of going in. Instead of having one casualty, you'll have two. One versus one is also not good. When a man is drowning, you don't know how to relieve, relieve him, you will also drown with him. Instead of helping him, you both will go down. Similarly is the case when someone who comes out of an i'tikaf or Ramadan, and he says, I'm gonna go and try to get my friends. My dear brothers, you need to know how to, how to work on this art, how to do it. So there's a whole art of bringing a change. It's not easy. And it, just like goodness comes into us, even goodness leaves also very quickly. So this is something where our, not young adults only, our elders have a hard time swallowing the bullet and the tablet, which is, which is you need to learn how to now become selective in who you hang out with. For example, I mentioned, this is a beautiful story, right? I'm, a portion of it is beautiful at least. <laughs> I'm thinking of a, of a, of a um, listen to this story. I'm thinking of a, of a brother somewhere far away from here. I, I, went, I did a program in his house, in his masjid. And then he, I, he hosted me at his home. And we were like far away, like, in, like mashallah, there's no major community masjid there. His children read the duas before we, we ate. The children gave adhan and iqama. And they were genuinely very sharif. Right? Very good mannered, well mannered kids. So I asked him, You're, you don't have any madrasa, no Islamic school, no major community. Like, how did you guys raise such beautiful kids? And he's like, no, alhamdulillah, it's a tarbiyah we do at home, this, that. I said, this is awesome, this is really good. Then, I told him, I invited him to come for Atikaf. This is like eight, nine years ago, maybe. I told him, come to Dar al-Salaam for the Atikaf. Ramadan is right around the corner, it will be a life-changing experience. So he is, you know, a practicing uh, physician with kids. Is that He said, oh, I love to, but I can't. I said, why? The answer he gave was, you know, ajib. He said, if I come, I know I'll change. But when I change, I'll have to go back and my, this is, he said, my entire khandan, all my relatives, they're secular. Our post e party, I'm the only one who's not drinking. From Pakistan, everyone's drinking. He said, I'm the only one that doesn't drink. So, uh, so now, I've heard, there's a little story about that too. I said, how are you not only the one who's not drinking, mashallah, your kids are hafiz. I think one of them or two of them are hafiz also. Uh, how? So this is again comes to the subject of friendship. He said, I was in medical school. His, his, his family is from the Pakistani army, you know? So he said, in medical school, there was one young tablighi brother in the medical school with him. And there was this very strict rule on the barracks or medical school, um, you know, hostel. You cannot do any type of other political thing. You can do Islamic movements all banned. So he said, this friend used to tell me, let's go out in Jawla, in Ziyarah. Let's go to Tabligh-i Jama'ah. Let's go join, sit and listen to their talks. Let's go visit. 
He introduced me to this. So he said, literally we used to, in the night or in the, after Asr or after the Lord, we used to jump over the wall and go to a nearby masjid where this effort was taking place and I would sit with him and listen to the talks. And that had this unbelievable change even though my entire family all drinking and no one would ever think of deen. But subhanAllah, deen came into me because of this friend who took me out in Jamaat. Hmm. And not even, probably not even three days, just sitting in the talk because I don't think he's allowed to go out for three days. Just sitting in the talk. He said that relationship that built, that exposure to deeny environment while in college because of one friend changed the course of my entire life that today I have her father in my home while all my brother's kids, Allah alam, even if they're Muslim, they're all drinking, first generation. So that's an amazing story of the power of having even one good friend and good environment. But the other reason, why did you not want to do Atikaf? He said, when I go back, I have to sit with my family and I'm going to feel out of place. So I can't change my status quo. I have to keep up that status quo. This is the reason why I don't want to do Atika. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's not an issue for the youth only. It's a major issue for adults as well, is how to navigate around with friends or previous friends once you're going through this change within yourself. How to handle that? You are wanting to say something. Many things. Okay. But no, um, so you're saying the answer is to go in Jamaat. Right? No. Well, that was a joke. No, no. So, uh, a lot of these questions are regarding people who are deeply entrenched in their friend group, right? Yeah. They've had these friends for years, maybe, and these friends know them intimately. So, how do you go about deciding, first of all, whether or not you need to set, you know, cut them off completely? Realistically, coming out of it, Dikaf, most people are not going to be on your wavelength, right? So, you're saying leave those friends who are not on your wavelength. How do you diagnose that? And then, how do you go about practically? doing that. And if the friend, sometimes the friend group, group is split. Right? Some people are with you, some people are not. So, SubhanAllah. Okay, so th this is one of the most important questions for all of us post-Ramadan. You know, because we are, I'm not saying this, the Prophet said, Al-Maru ala dini khalilihi. A man follows the religion of his friend. That's it. The reason you and I are doing what we're doing right now is because we're surrounded by it. This is, it, playing game councils right now, or Fortnite in the middle of the night at 3 a.m., which is probably normal outside, or playing or watching some other you know, Netflix, is, it would be a normal thing outside. But it's absolutely unacceptable in this environment. So none of us are even trying to do that, alhamdulillah. Right? Because you, you don't want to be the sore thumb here. You're going to go with the flow. But that's the thing. We have to find people of the same flow outside. Are there outside people like this? Of course they are. They are. And all of our, all of our communities have, mashallah, God-fearing, good-practicing people. We have to find them. Now, how do you differentiate who is, a good, who is a good friend and who is maybe not the best? There's many ways to answer this question. One answer comes to mind is the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, where he said three qualities of a friend. Three qualities that you should have in a friend. Number one, مَنْ ذَكَّرَكُمْ بِاللَّهِ رُؤْيَتُهُ Number two, وَنْ زَادَ فِي عِلْمِكُمْ مَنْطِقُهُ Number three, ذَكَّرَكُمْ بِالْآخِرَةِ عَمَلُهُ First is when you look at him, you remember Allah. He said that should be the quality of your friend. When you look at him, you remember Allah. Number two, when he speaks, your knowledge increases about something, beneficial knowledge. Even if it's dunya, we knowledge. History lesson, English lesson, he corrects your, corrects your grammar. It's knowledge. Right? So whatever, whenever he speaks, you're increasing in knowledge. Number three, And his actions remind you that you have to face Allah one day. Meaning he leads such a scrupulous life. He leads a life of such ethics and value. And fear of Allah is what guides him even though no one is around looking. And you see, the only reason this guy would be doing this is because he fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everyone's cheating on the exam. The, the, they're able to hack into the computer and get all the exa you know, exam questions the day before. This the guy is the guy who's like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see it. Why would you do that, man? Everyone's watching. I don't care. So that's, that's what you call a person who's doing that. His action reminds you of the akhirah. So now when you look at your circle of friends, will you immediately find someone like all three? Probably not. It's okay, but that's our goal. That's what we want to get at. The key thing is we will have to see that we should have a litmus, basic fundamental thing. In my presence, I will not tolerate haram. That's it. Person smokes, okay, but not in front of me. Person drinks, not in front of me. Don't, I don't want even to hear about it. Don't ask, don't tell. You want to play basketball together? We'll play basketball together. You want to play soccer together? We'll play soccer together. We'll do something together. But I don't want to know about your private life. All you're doing is you're making me a proof against you on the Day of Judgment. And that's the day when friends will turn against one another for the sake of getting their back skin safe from Jahannam. Hmm. Why do you want to do this? Why do you want me to have a proof against you? I don't want to hear it. 
So this should be the basic minimum, bare minimum thing is that whatever haram someone's involved in, I don't need to hear it. I don't want to hear it. Because what happens is when we hear bad things, sinful things that people are doing, the more times we hear about it, the more desynthesized we become to it. And then we start normalizing it. Once you normalize listening to it, you, Allah forbid, you will start normalizing doing it. That's how it is. You don't immediately jump into a sin. First is the repugnance of that sin goes away from the heart. How does that go away? By overexposure, by constantly listening and hearing and talking and joking about it. Allah forbid one day end up doing it. So that's one thing we should say that no, this is a line I, I don't want to cross. I don't want to hear people making fun of the Quran, making fun of the Sunnah, making fun of people who are religious, making people fun of people who are trying to follow the deen. I'm sorry, that's a line I can't cross. You can't cross. You, whatever you do at home in your, friend, in your own thing, you can have a, another set of group of friends, that's up to you. But with me, we can go out, hang out and stuff like that. But this and that. I think this should be a bare minimum. I guess it also comes down to how you define a friend. Because if someone's behaving that way towards you, are they really a true friend? This is why Imam Ghazali actually does a very beautiful job. If someone has got Bidayatul Hidayah here, bring me a copy of it. The, the, uh, the, he, he, he makes a category of relationships. He says, not everyone's your friend. He says, some of them are. This is, it's, yeah, bring it. It's really... Uh, oh, mashallah. Here, I got it. <laughs> um, so... He, he, talk, he talks about the different types of relationships that exist amongst people, right? And di- okay, so one is al-majhulin. He says one is majhulin, people who you don't know. Just write, like someone, majhul. I don't know you, you don't know me, just majhul. So he talks about how people on a bus, people on a train today would say, a random person on the bus, a random person on the train, oh, random person in your public school classroom, college classroom, a uh, random person at the airport. This is all how to treat them. Number two is al ikhwa al he says, brothers and friends. Okay? Uh, can I just go through this? No. <laughs> right? So he says... Um, <laughs> no, just answer. Just the, the, the two things. The first duty, right? Is, is that just make sure... Look at here. You just said, how do you know he's good for a friend? He said, make sure the first duty is to check for the presence of the prerequisite qualities of companionship and friendship before you take him as a friend. That's a key thing. Okay. And that is, I think, what you need to do is making sure that is this person, is he giving, is he bringing positive vibes to me? Is he, when I stick with him, do I overall walk away more happy, more fulfilled, more, uh, you know, concerned about my dunya well-being and ukhra well-being? There are certain people, honestly, who, who claim to be friends. And every time you sit with them, they literally, they are friends. They go out to eat. But then they will take jabs at you. They will make fun of your appearance. They will make fun of your, uh, uh, you know, presentation. They will make fun of your parents. Audhu billah. They'll make fun of your lifestyle. And a person is continuously just going out because of I don't know why they feel like this is, uh, you know, something to do. But these are not people you want to hang out with. Who make you feel guilty? Who make you feel that you are worthless? And who instead of, um, that's what Imam Ghazali also speaks about. That who are jealous. Do you know that? There are people who are, act like friends who are actually genuinely, genuinely jealous of you. Okay? You have to go through that to know what that's about. But they're, they're, they exist out there. I think there's a level of insecurity about it too, right? If you see somebody becoming more religious than you. Oh yeah. The insecurity and guilt. 100%. That is very, very true. Misery loves company. The guy who gets kicked out of the classroom for making a monkey face or throwing a paper airplane, what does he do when he goes outside? He looks up through the window and he tries to get the other guys out. He also looks at them. Why are you laughing? Uh, Get out, right? That's what happens. The guy outside, he tries to make the guy inside the classroom laugh. I don't know if they still kick, kick kids out of class. I'm not sure. But they used to when we were little kids, right? Used to get in trouble. Used to ask, you'd be asked to leave the classroom. This is misery. The guy's out. He, he wants to get other guys out in the hallway. Same thing. People who are not following the deen or some aspect of the deen and they feel insecure, like you said, when they see someone who is following it. And so they, they feel uncomfortable until they convert you back to where they are. Because it's like, okay, we have this relationship. Either I'm going to have an effect on you or you're going to have an effect on me. Mm. And you having an effect on me for them is like, that means you're stronger in this relationship. And I don't like that. You have the upper hand. I don't like that. I like to, want, I like to be the loud uh, person who, who controls this. Uh, the power differential should be on my end. I should be the one who's controlling this relationship. So that's why I have to ensure that I can change you from your religiosity back to where you started. Otherwise, it will prove my weakness. Mm. 
And that's how kind of psychology, psychologically it works for some people. So, but that was one thing, what you just said. But another thing is just being afraid, being wary of people who tug at you and who try to, like I have had my own share of fair experience of this. So I'm, I'm telling you that SubhanAllah, they come in all sorts of sizes and colors, all sorts of people. Wallahi, they come with the be most beautiful smile. You know, when I read these um, posts on WhatsApp status and people talking about friends, I, it's real. It really is real. There are certain people who come to you as a friend and they're just straight up backstabbers. And you have to understand, if any time you come, hey man, I have an idea. Really? What's your idea? Let's start this. Oh man, it's just a stupid idea. If there's a guy around you who always says that to every idea you say, he's not your friend. Every time you want to start something, he says, come on, you can't do that. He's not your friend. Every time you go up and, and you mess up, I can't believe it. You, have the, you just really, you made a fool out of yourself up there. That's not your friend. A friend is the one who doesn't mind you leading him in salah. Even though, and he might be more knowledgeable. He's like, what up brother, go ahead man. He doesn't mind you taking, taking the driver's seat. He doesn't, mind, he doesn't mind you ordering at dinner. He doesn't mind you taking a leadership role because he honestly, he's not jealous of you, he loves you. It's not about, it doesn't hurt him to see you in front. And the guy who's jealous, he can't see you in front. He has to see you in the back. He is a parasite. He uses you for his own ego. Because we have this desire to have people around us. So in reality, he wants to use you, we call so-called friend, but to boost his own ego and boost his own sense of self-worth because he doesn't have anything for self-worth. So he creates a sense of self-worth by having followers. Hmm. So it's not a friendship relationship. He's trying to make it into a follower and followed relationship. When even though he's not worthy of being followed, you don't need that. You need someone else to follow, not him. So those type of people who put you down and who destroy your ambitions, who talk, talk down to you, who, who belittle you, who ruin your confidence are people you definitely want to stay away from. Okay. So, somebody who's coming out of this and they're intent on becoming more religious, so you're telling them to diagnose their friendships, right? Essentially, kind of divide it up into who has potential to help lift me up and who's going to hold me back. Yes. Yeah? And then what's the practical steps to... It's a two-part question. How do you practically cut off the people that you say are in this group and then how do you kind of help lift up the people in the good group without coming across as judgmental or pushy? My beloved brothers, when, you know, uh, if, someone's, if someone's, Allah forbid, someone's mother is in the ICU, and a bunch of friends say, hey, we're going out to eat for Suhoor, you're not going to feel ashamed and shy to say, you know what, you all go and enjoy, I'm not coming. It's, there's no shame in here. And if you get asked a second time, you're gonna shout back. Say, are you crazy? I have such a huge calamity in my home, and you're telling me, let's go out to eat? What's wrong with you? This is the reality of our life. If we know where we're headed, that we're headed in a wrong direction, and my life is about to, get, to fall off the cliff, and Allah forbid I may gain Allah's wrath, then we will truly love ourselves more than anyone else. It comes about, I have to care about myself. The desire, this is what it needs. We have to, have to understand that number one, be greedy and self-conscious about your own salvation. That's it. Everyone else comes, what do they say in the airplane? No matter who's sitting next to you, put the oxygen mask on yourself. If you don't, then you're going to become unconscious and forget about helping anyone else. You're not going to be able to help yourself. If you take care of yourself, you'll be able to help others. Same thing is that when we leave from here, we have to tell ourselves that these people uh, are maybe great Look at this, I'm phrasing it, listen to this. These people are committing sins, and guess what? I'm not the, I'm not the no sahabi or wali. I also commit sins. I have committed a bunch. But I, unfortunately, I'm too weak that while I stay in the presence of them, I actually get worse. These people are just like me. They're sinful, I'm sinful too. Maybe we would just sin in a different manner. I love that statement. Don't look down upon someone just because they sin in a manner different from you. When we leave from Atikaf, don't think we're gonna stop sinning. It's just the method of sinning will change. Hopefully, hopefully no more major, but definitely everyone sins. So we should never look down upon someone because they're sinning in a different manner than we are. So you don't want to start dis yani, debasing any of our old friends. That's horrible. We cannot debase old friends. However, we should just say, the brother is sick, and I am no doctor to cure him, treat him. Just like we are uh, protect ourselves during COVID or our flu season, Similarly, when someone has got a flu, you don't look down upon him. You feel sympathy towards him. You're not going to say, I hate this guy because he's got a flu. You're going to say, I, my immunity is weak. If I spend too much time with him, I may get sick. 
So for that reason, I gotta stay away from him until he gets better. That's it. So friends who are toxic, we're not gonna hate anyone. We're not gonna look down upon anyone. We're gonna say, I just don't have the method to treat this individual. And I myself, my immunity is weak. I will start picking up bad habits from him. So I will make dua that Allah cures him. And in the meantime, I will continue to build myself up. And if Allah wills, one day I'll come back and help him. All right? And you cut them off. But then when it comes to cutting off, it depends on how, yani, how, how strong of an effect they have. Yes, some of them you have to cut off. I know individuals, Allahu Akbar, this is the root cause of evil in society. Why is that Hiv student who leaves madrasa go off track? Why is that student from who's the number one in the Islamic school goes off track? Why? We have countless stories. It's because of who they start hanging out once they leave the madrasa. Who they start hanging out once they leave the Islamic school. Or the type of friends they actually had within Islamic school. Or within the Hiv madrasa itself. That's what it is. People say, I sent him to Islamic school, Hiv school is set. No, it's not set. Who are, you could be in public school, come out better than a guy who goes to Hiv school in, in, in Islamic school. How? By the type of friends you keep. Because there's bad people or sick people everywhere. And if your son or daughter or yourself ends up in the wrong crowd in a madrasa or in an Islamic school, it actually can have a worse outcome than someone who went to public school but stayed with good people. So certain, in, is, many times, those extremely toxic and strong influential people who have a strong influence on us, we simply have to learn how to cut ourselves off from them. Now, it might be tough for us. Then what do we do? A person goes off the radar, right? Before, for me and him, I literally disappeared, right? I don't even know if you knew I was going. Did you know I was going? 98. You know when I... Oh, 98, no. Yeah, right? So, because yeah. we didn't have cell phones. We had home phones. <laughs> right? We had phone number, home phones. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, we, so what happened? How am I going to go call? And it's going to be... It's gonna, it's, thank you, you have reached a Sharif residence. So it would be probably... You showed up after four months. Yes. And I was like, where were you? And you said, South Africa. That's it. That's, yeah, what you're that's how I found somehow, out. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that's how it was. I just left to South Africa and came back um, uh, in Eid break and went to visit all my friends. And they just couldn't believe where did I come back from. They had no idea. <laughs> my whole class had no idea. School, the friends had no idea. That's how it was before. So basically, previously, it was very easy to go off the radar and change your life. Just go somewhere else. Right now, what you need to do is, for example, deleting your social media account. Right? That's a big thing. Just because people don't even communicate out here nowadays through text or phone. It's all online social media. Is that correct? So when you, when you delete that, you have kind of erased your identity. And changing, not even changing your phone number. If that needs to do that, do that. I know certain individuals. You know one guy who is going through a lot of problems? I used to call him. He did it because of his friends. You know that uh, the AT&T or cellular one number, you've reached the wrong number. You know what I'm trying to say? That number thing, that old voice, that old message recording? Yeah. He somehow got that recording and made that part of his voice message, voicemail. Oh, so when you'd call him, it would give you the message that, oh, sorry, you've called the wrong number. But it was actually a recording, which was very ingenious. And the reason he did that was because he needed to get away from all his old friends. So that they would think that his number has been disconnected when actually it was not disconnected. Hmm. Okay? That's what I'm trying to say. Is that we need to learn how to just go cold turkey on those relationships. And this is straight from the Quran and the first page of the 19th Jews. Allah Azza wa Jalla speaks about this. There was, there was a very famous incident of two disbelievers. One of them who was invited to the Prophet Prophet he invited the Prophet to his house for a big feast because he had come back successfully from a business trip. And the, the habit in the Meccans was that when you come back from a, from a trip through the desert, safe and sound, you would throw a da'wat and throw, throw, throw a party to, of showing appreciation. The Prophet came to the house and then he said, I'm not gonna eat until you, you accept Islam. And so it was an issue about his honor. A guest walking away without eating, how am I gonna face society? So he says, okay, 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 fine. He said, say it. So he said, he, he gave him da'wah, of course he accepted it. He said, ashadu la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna ka rasulullah. He accepted Islam. The Prophet sallallahu you know, probably partook, partook from the meal and moved on. When his friend, Umayyah ibn Khalf, met him, he says, what? What did I just hear happen at your house? This was Uqba ibn Abi Marid. What, did, what happened at your house? He says, what happened? He says, is this serious? He says, no man, what are you talking about? Of course not serious. Allah alam whether he was serious or not, more than likely he was serious. But he told his friend, instead of saying, you know what? Go to hell. Because right? that's where you're headed right now. I was going to hell. Alhamdulillah, I'm going to paradise now. I'm not going to, uh, you know, continue on this friendship. He should have done that. But because it was, so, it, was a, it was a very difficult pill for him to swallow. So he said, uh, uh, oh, oh, I was just joking. He says, 
Well, how do I know? He says, I'll do anything to prove it. Same like gang mentality. Exact same thing. So he said, okay, I, I, I no longer believe him to be a prophet. He said, no, no, you're not going to get off the hook that fast. So what do you want me to do? He said, I will be He said, I want you to go and go spit on the face of the Prophet. I will be So that, this fool, that's exactly what he did. He literally went and he did this. And obviously, he became a disbeliever. Allah mentions about him in the Quran. And he says, on the day of judgment, the oppressor, the one who oppressed not others, he oppressed himself. By spitting on the Prophet, he oppressed no one besides himself. What is he going to do? You know when you're nervous, you bite your nails. This guy's not going to be biting his nails, he's not going to be biting his fingers, he's going to be biting his hand. His entire hand will be in his mouth. He'll be chewing it out of intensity of his anxiety and anguish. And he'll be saying, Yaqul, he'll say, Ya laytani, Ya laytani takhastum ar rasuli sabila. Man, I wish, I wish, I wish I had followed the path of the Prophet. Ya laytani lam attakhit fulan khalila. I wish I had never taken this guy as my friend. Laqad adallani an al dhikr. This man has misled me from the truth, misled me from remembrance of Allah. Ba'da id ja'ani after the truth came in my lap, it came in my house. The Prophet was in his house. Allah says, وَكَانَ الشَّيْطَانُ لِلْإِنسَانِ خَذُولًا And shaitan, he acts like your friend. But in reality, he's the biggest khadula, the biggest backstabber. That's what he does. He's so good. He says, come, 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 come in, come in, come in. As soon as he gets you in, he's gone. And I can go, go, you know, mention many verses about that. But the shaitan from the humans and the shaitan from the jinn are just like this. They get you into trouble and then they run away. So this ayah tells us clearly that this is what's going to happen to people who gave up the truth, who gave up the good habits they had because they wanted to stay fit into their, to be in with the friend circle, that they're going to pay a very hefty price on the Day of Judgment. And what happened to him? Yeah, Allah Azza wa his, his death came in a miserable manner. Uh, Nabi Ahiyu, he attacked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Oh Allah, allow one of, the, one of your dogs to destroy him. And so, uh, kill him. And what happened? It was just a small, um, uh, 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 I think it was an issue of, remember, if I'm remembering the story, if it was just a, a small little uh, injury that he got, but he began to cry so much, so much, so much. And he said, why are you crying? You are such a brave leader. Why are you crying over such a small scratch or injury? And he said, no. I heard the Prophet cursing me. This is going to kill me. Ajeeb. He had that yaqeen. He had that conviction on the dua of Rasulullah on this curse. And sure enough, of course, he died from that. Um, so your advice for the negative friend group, cut them off. Cut them off on socials, block them, pretty much isolate yourself from them. When it comes to the good group, then how do you help them elevate without coming across as judgmental or too pushy? The best way to bring any change in anyone is through environment. The same thing that helped you, helped me and helped everyone is environment. It's not you and I speaking to one another. Uh, giving long lectures. It's rather the environment the, through osmosis you learn. Through osmosis you grow. You know, I've been speaking about every night about the air outside, correct? The air outside in the world. The, and so there's an air within Darul Salaam. So what, a big chunk of what you learn is not through the classes over here or through the lectures that are given here. It's actually through the air in this institution. May Allah always keep the air pure and clean. Right? When a person enters here, he will automatically feel the difference. Isn't that so? When you're here for even one salah, you'll feel the difference. There's something within the air. Even a non-Muslim, I remember a couple years ago during the retreat, before the retreat even began, a non-Muslim person came for a delivery of something. So he, he it was, you know, I said, bring it into the courtyard. He was delivering garbage bags. So then I said, have you been here before? He said, no. I said, let me give you a tour. He said, oh really? I can get a tour? I said, yeah. So much it was empty as Jummah. So he was wearing his, uh, t- uh, you know, his t-shirt t- uh, and, and he had his you know, sleeves, sleeveless and he had a bunch of tattoos. I brought him inside here. Wallahi, right here under this dome, under this chandelier. I brought him here and I started reading to him these verses of the Qur'an, reading to him the names of Allah. Before I could even finish, right, he did this to me. He said, look at me, man. Look at me. He's showing me his hand. What was he showing me? Goosebumps. He started showing me goosebumps. Wallahi, he said, this place is spiritual. Not Muslim. I say, yes, subhanAllah, it is spiritual. You're very right. You have a, you're a person of fitrah. Of, you're on the innate nature. Come here in the night and inshallah attend the program. You'll benefit even more. So the, what I'm trying to say is a lot of what we, what we want to teach and impart to another person in our friend circle, it should not be done frankly, abruptly by us. 
it should be, you should ease them into it. And this is for anyone, your mom, dad, sister, brother, spouse, children. Just find programs within your area. Not everyone is from Chicago. Wherever you are from, I'm sure there are some beautiful good programs happening somewhere in your drivable distance. And of course in Chicago, Alhamdulillah, we have so many amazing programs all over. Take, figure out a method of how to go with your friend. Say you're going to go out to eat and sit in a program. Say you're going to play basketball and then you know, attend a program for half an hour. It could be something as simple as arranging a run-in. You know the rishta, how they set it up? At least they used to before. Now, now it's just blatant shamelessness. But before it's like, oh, we just, oh, we just bump into someone. You know, plan, plan a bump in. The auntie herself will say, Chalo, you know, I'll bring my daughter there also. You bring your son there. And then inshallah, you know, just they can, whatever. Just see each other and then afterwards we can talk. So now we need to have a setup to say you're going out to eat. You tell, you tell a person who you think, let's say um, you're a physician. You see another physician, mashallah, who's, a, who's very successful as a physician and a very practicing, outstanding Muslim. You're working on another fellow physician. So how to do that? You say, hey, we're going to, uh, um, you know, a, a medical conference, all right? But that other, you make sure that the other doctor is there at that slot time as well. Mm -hmm. So you happen to go to the conference and then you happen to grab lunch together. And so now it's very organic. You're sitting three of you and talking, all right? And so he's speaking to you, but in reality he's speaking to him. So he gets, mashallah, the da'wah from another person of his stature, of his background, uh, in a very so-called non-judgmental, non-abrasive, non-pressurized, type of environment. Whether it's an ice cream shop, it's a medical conference, whatever it is, we can plan these things out. That you bump into a scholar or bump into a person who is religious in that same field and basically give good exposure to that friend. So you trap them, trick them and trap them. Yeah. <laughs> um, there are quite a few, you kind of touched on this, but there are quite a few questions on uh, the spouse. So if somebody wants their wife, for example, or their wife wants her husband to become more religious, then how do you go about implementing that or guiding them. Is there a way for us to take um, uh, on, on YouTube chat for questions from those listening online? I know there's a lot of people listening, mashallah. But if there is someone there who can go through the chat also and ask questions from there, that'll be good. Uh, your question is how to work on the spouse. Hmm. Correct? Maybe the spouse is at home and the spouse is here. One spouse is here, one spouse is here. Someone's thinking about the other, mashallah. So I think this is the same thing. The same thing is that we need to uh, work uh, through environments. If you, if the, they say, you know, the, well, yeah. the wife and husband relation is very unique. So that's why it's very hard for the wife to respect the husband or the husband, you know, to take the wife seriously. It's just how it is. You need to get that tarbiyah or that, 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 that you need pep talk through someone else. So I, it's just also finding good company for our spouse. Finding good company for ourselves. Um, for example, like, for inv inv let's say you have a lot of dawats at home, a lot of parties at home, all the time. Now you find people to say, you know what, mashallah, we've, we're always cooking and feeding people. And now you find people in the community, alhamdulillah, whose wives are practicing the deen, and who are good influence, who you think would be a good influence on your wife. So you're already having a party, on, let's say once every month or once every two months. We say, let's, I want to invite one brother from, his, from the masjid. I met an br amazing brother in Atikaf. I want to invite him and his family over. He's with his kids. MashaAllah, you're talking, relaxing. There's no bayan going on. It's literally suhbah, suhbah. Oh, uh, Ben, it's time for maghrib. Can I just pray there? Maybe the sister never prays. But she sees, mashallah, this person, this lady, she's also this, 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 a high achiever, whatnot. But look at that, man. She just went and prayed her maghrib salah. Right? I'm just saying, she's not showing off. She's doing her thing. After maghrib, she's in there doing her dhikr. Then they talk about, oh, how, what are your kids doing? I'm doing this, this, this. But mashallah, I haven't, I'm, she's just talking about how she tries the best to make sure the children's deen doesn't get neglected. Whatever it may be, through, through some sort of chit-chat, there could be a lot of communication of deen. And I think we need to invite this type of conversation at home. Similarly for women who want to work on their husbands. Mashallah, I've met an amazing sister at tonight's, uh, you know, women, mom and daughter event at Dar Salaam. Okay, you know what, can you, Mashallah, she says, oh, my husband, Alhamdulillah, is doing atikaf and he's a regular, etc. You know, we love for you to come over to my house, right? And, 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 and uh, have a dinner with us. And uh, that's it, you eat dinner, whatever it is. So you find ways, and it, just, it doesn't have to be one person, it could be your normal friends and this other brother. Or your normal friends and this other sister. So he kind of eases in. Shouldn't feel like, oh man, this is very intimidating. Right? So he's one out of four who's there. And inshallah, if he's a good brother, he will rub off in a positive manner. Or a sister will rub off in a good positive manner. So nothing too, nothing too abrupt. Exactly. Abruptness does not work. It'll, it'll fail. 
Um, I mean, seriously, uh, it, unless there's some life changing experience, uh, Umrah, Hajj, Ramadan, Atikaf, you know, like she's also like listening to all the programs, lectures. Uh, I, one thing for the brothers and sisters who are not married yet, some brothers like oh, yesterday, someone asked me, I, 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 I went looking for a, ma- for a spouse. I think I found some. I'm not sure what are the questions I should ask. I said, if she listens to the nightly lectures and she's okay with them, she's okay then, you know. <laughs> so there are, mashallah, many. Many brothers here who, who actually whose fiancés uh, or yani recently married, they listen together. And this is really good. It doesn't have to be this program. It could be any program. I feel that a uh, husband and wife-to-be and those who are already married, one of the great things you could do is choose one scholar that you have a personal relationship with and listen to them together. You don't have to be sitting together different times, but let the words of that scholar go into your home at the same time. So now it's not like, oh, you said, he said and she said and whatever. It's like, the scholar today, he whipped me. Today, tomorrow he whipped me. You know, he said something to you. It's, it's, it's like, it's not about, it's about the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah speaking to us and not me speaking. So that I think can become very beneficial. If you have a mentor or you have a scholar that you connect with, listening to their programs, husband and wife together, um, I think can have a very positive effect in bringing change. Um, multiple, multiple people are asking about uh, how you navigate pre-existing relationships with non-Muslims. So, non-Muslims you deal with in school, right? You know, girls in your class, uh, people you work with, uh, friends you might have, or have from beforehand. What do you do uh, once you come out of a situation like this and you feel like you want to institute some type of change, but you're not exactly sure how to For the non-Muslim to go. friend? Yeah. You know, if, the, if, it's, if they are of the opposite gender, just connect to a Muslim of the opposite, you know, of that gender. So if a brother says, I'm, I'm working on this sister to accept Islam, no brother. There are, mashallah, maybe 700 million sisters out there, 800 million sisters. Get up to one of those. You don't need to be working on that. Right? And if there's a sister says, I'm giving da'wah to this brother, no, you don't need to do that. Mashallah, connect him with amazing brothers out there. You don't get involved in that. And um, no matter who you are. I remember one doctor, he, mashallah, he was telling me. He said, I have sometimes secretaries, nurses. Mashallah, very big clinic. He said, they come and say, oh, I want to learn about Islam. He said, I'm married with kids, kids are in college, but maybe getting married. He said, but that's a line I don't cross. I said, mashallah, very good. Uh, there's a masjid has this program for sisters. This is the number. Bas, don't, not, I'm not going to talk about this. Because he said, I'm not going to, this is a slippery slope. He said, a slippery slope. Of course, he does it in a nice and kind manner. Obviously, he doesn't do it in three seconds. But he just lets them know that, I'm, oh, this is very nice, and I will connect you with a sister who can help you with this. So, yeah. But what if it's somebody you're already working with for four years, right? Then you come out, of itikaf and then they say hey so and so and you're like I can't look at you your hair is haram so what do you what do you do right you know this is the, there are stories of sahaba that's why we have to read hayatul sahaba after asr that we read a portion try to read one two hadith a day hayatul sahaba when you read it remember that book hayatul sahaba stories of sahaba by Mulana Yusuf Khandabi rahmatullahi translated in Arabic translated in Urdu available uh, everywhere very popular book when you read through those stories you see what does iman actually mean. Iman is not some cultural thing. Iman is next level, man. It completely changes a person. And, and that's what it's supposed to happen to me and you. Where um, there's, a, I don't, uh, there's an incident where um, a person, he came in, he was with his girlfriend and, and uh, during the Jahiliya time. And he went in with a very bad intention to harm the Prophet ﷺ. He entered the tawa, mataf to go harm the Prophet ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he was next to him walking and he was going to try to stab him or kill him. The Prophet ﷺ grabbed him and he immediately asked him, what are you here for? He got caught, right? And subhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ put his hand on his chest if I remember correctly. And, um, and the Prophet ﷺ gave him da'wah and alhamdulillah he accepted Islam. And what happened? He came out of the masjid and from the door of the masjid in Hayat al-Sahaba, you can find it, huge line of poetry, lines and lines of poetry he started reciting to his ex-girlfriend to say, I'm sorry, I loved you and I did, he, he want, if I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, he wanted to do this for her. He wanted to do this for her. I had to harm the Prophet ﷺ for her. She was a big mushrika too. So he went in from the door, from the door of the, from the maharam, he said, he was, many, many lines of poetry. I have nothing to do with you. I absolve myself from you. And because I've, I've turned to Islam. Within minutes, but that's exactly what Iman and Islam does to a person. If it's truly entered, a person says, this relationship is haram. Either you accept Islam or, I'm sorry, either you, bec- you become, like we get married, 
or this is not a meaning, this is something I can continue with. And mashallah, mashallah, so many people do it. Let's look at converts. Mashallah, I'm sure there are many converts sitting here as well. Alhamdulillah. Look at them, and if you think you're having a hard time to give them, how, how much these converts have given up within sometimes the same day. They give up everything, give up everything. Hindu converts, Christian converts, other converts, mashallah, huge sacrifices. Be inspired by them to say if they've given up everything, why cannot give up? It's one thing. And especially a haram relationship that is of, uh, you know, that is of no good. That one, I've got everything going. You say, I got everything good, but I just got this. No, my friend. It's that one thing. Brothers, please move forward and fill up these gaps. Can you move forward, inshallah? There's gaps here. Come, 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 move forward. Please, let's not leave any gaps in between. There's barakah when we sit close together. And the shaitan comes in between us when we sit far away. So let's sit close together. Allah reward you. Allah bless you all. Allah increase you in your knowledge. Allah increase you in your practice. Allah increase you in your taqwa. Sit as close as possible, inshallah. So when a person, um, you know, has one haram relationship going on, then in that case, that's exactly what the window, <laughs> you're wondering why is the house not warming up? I got the heat blowing so high, 75 degrees, it's still freezing cold because you got that one window open. It just takes one window to make the whole house cold, yes? It just takes one haram in your life to not allow you to feel the warmth of Ramadan, the warmth of fasting, the warmth of tahajjud. So a person needs to close that window. Yes? But just to clarify, you're saying if you have a haram relationship, don't break up with the with the girl through a poem, right? <laughs> I mean, do whatever you need to do, man. Uh, honestly, These it's like... romantic guys. Uh, okay, let me tell you one hadith. Until one hadith. Ana inda munkasratil quloob. The Prophet ﷺ said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you want to find me, you will find me with those whose hearts are broken. Hmm. What does this hadith mean? There are multiple different meanings of this. But one meaning is, the one who bro whose heart is broken for the sake of Allah. I have of course dealt with boys who are crying because they were in a haram relationship, now they're making tawbah and they came to the deen and now they have to give up because she doesn't want to accept Islam or she doesn't want to you know, become, she doesn't want to get married, she just wants to do haram for example. So then they'll sit and cry. And I said, honestly, you, are, you right now, you are this close to Allah. The pain you're going through, the crying over the fact that you had to break away from this haram is what's going to make you so close to Allah. Because Allah Himself is saying, if you want to find me, you will find me with those whose hearts are broken. Li ajali for me. You, why, are you, why, did you, why is your heart broken? Because you gave this haram relationship for Allah, not for anyone else. So now ask Allah, when you're in pain, when you're in emotional pain, you're heartbroken, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and say, Ya Allah, please give me something far, 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 far better than this. This is, I thought this was good, but now allow me to see something that is going to be is, is, is spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially, in every sense of the word, allow me to find a much better spouse. And inshallah, wa ta'ala, Allah will not let you down. There's so many virtues that talk about someone who gives up haram for the sake of Allah, that Allah Azza wa Jal will most definitely replace it with something that will be far, far, far superior. It's never gonna happen. Wallah, never gonna happen. Never gonna happen. That you give up haram for the sake of Allah and Allah puts you in bigger trouble. You give up haram for the sake of Allah, Allah will give you something far, far superior than you can imagine. This is kind of an interesting question because I think it kind of uh, reflects the way society is now. It's because a uh, person's asking, uh, if you're becoming more religious and you have a friend group that's becoming more religious, but their religiosity is a little bit different from yours, right? There are certain things that they find acceptable that you don't. So what do you do in that situation? Well, I mean, again, it's, it's about not being with them on certain things, right? Uh, those things, if someone says, that I, I like a big issue about, about zabiha, for example. A group of friends are sharp praying. Someone says, I make sure I eat uh, properly in zabiha food. Another friend says, No, I eat from anything, anywhere. So now, but he's, that's the one issue he has. So now you have to be able to, to, at least for that, you don't have to end the relationship. But a person could say, At least then when we're eating out together, we're going to eat out at a place that is acceptable to both of us. Right? That is, I mean, you, the person who, who, who is not eating, uh, uh, you know, this type of uh, slaughter, Islamically slaughtered meat. He doesn't have a problem with eating. It's not like you're gonna, it's, it's against his, 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 uh, his uh, faith. So by e eating at a place where both can agree, or simply doing activities besides eating, you know what I mean? Figure out a way that that sin doesn't come in between us. Or which you regard as a sin, but he doesn't. Right? Uh, you don't need to, you don't, what I'm trying to say is not the end of the world. There are things like that. It just depends on, of course, I give an example. It might be some other things that he doesn't think it's a problem but it's clearly haram, then in that case, again, you'll say, just not do it in front of me, and I don't want to know about it, but let's just not talk about it. 
So does, does that apply to a religious gathering that somebody might think is acceptable, but you don't? So now if they're going there to a religious gathering that is, you think is not acceptable, then you yourself should not go. It's the same thing. It's like they think that you don't need to, you can eat meat from McDonald's and Burger King. They're going out to eat. They just had, they have a wrapper, a burger wrapper, which is like the always telltale sign, right? You sit in the car and they're quickly hiding their McDonald's wrapper, right? Or Burger King wrapper. So they went out and ate out together. I'm mean, sorry, they went and ate out themselves. You are not invited to that. Now you're going to, in, you're invited to having, mashallah, suhoor here, a properly, you know, a proper meat. So, you weren't part of that gathering where he went out to eat with, let's say, at a haram restaurant. And you can't say, I'm not going to sit and have suhoor with you. So someone who says that I'm going to a gathering in which you feel, for example, men and women are sitting next to each other, or there's music there, or there are uh, uh, people who are not dressed appropriately, or there's other issues happening. It's like a shifty stuff happening. There's some, you know, um, weird bid'ah happening there. So a person does, should not participate, even if your friend yanks you to say, go, he says, no man, I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna attend there. But they may not be at a level to understand that that's a harmful place to go, maybe. So take it easy, but at least you gotta protect yourself. Once sometimes a person starts seeing, he himself say, no, please, one day, you gotta tell me why you're not coming, man. It's been three days. Every time we should go together, why not? So then one day, when it's the right moment, you can explain your reasoning. And maybe that person will, inshallah, start seeing things to say, you know what, man, you actually, what you say makes sense. But you gotta take that, you know, slowly. But when it comes to your own participation, I and mean, if you understand something is wrong, then don't participate, whether it's a haram restaurant or a gathering that has some things that are un-Islamic. Um, so if, if that does happen, if that does occur, you're, you might be in danger of losing that friendship as well, right? Man, could, uh, that, the going to a gathering of some sorts, if that is, defines you, then that's a problem. Like, that's it. Okay, if you don't come to me with this gathering, I'm not your friend anymore? Really? Well, it kind of comes, you come to a crossroad at a certain point to decide what kind of Muslim you want to be, right? Which direction do you want to go in? Yeah. So, uh, maybe someone's will hurt. I think, I think most people are not like that. I don't know. I think most people, it's just like convenience. It's just there. You know what I'm trying to say? It's like uh, not necessarily their gung ho, um, uh, you know, feel that this is this must. It's a must. It just happens to be on the table, so I'm eating it. You know, it doesn't mean that I'll go run around the whole place to find that specific dish. It's there for available, so I'll have it. I mean, you don't like it, I want to have it, but I'm not so crazy about it that I have to go searching for it. I think that's how most people are. I could be wrong. So if some, I, if but if it comes that someone says no, I have to have sushi for suhoor at all costs. And you're like, you're crazy, I can't have sushi every single day, what are you talking about? So I maybe mean, have the firaq obayni obaynik, you know? This is a time to part ways. If someone really makes this into a, uh, you know, make it or break it thing, then you have, then, you know, you'll just say, uh, for me it's not, if you're making it as a make it or break it, then um, we'll meet whenever you choose to in the future, you know, type of thing. Quite a few people are asking, um, if it comes to a situation like that where you have to break off people, and move forward, how do you go about finding new friends? You find out by new friends, brother, is by, by, by simply going to the places you weren't going before. Most of you are here in Atikaf, you got to know, all of you got to know new people. You never knew each other. You're from different states, different cities, different masjids, different schools, different colleges, different workplaces. Amazing relationships are built here. So you ended up coming to a place like this and you found new friends. So you just have to figure out you know, what I'm trying to say is like you're moving to a new community. Sit with a group, a new group of people that are there in the masjid. People who are, let's say, staying back after Fajr. First of all, going for Fajr. You're going to find a different group of people on a random Thursday morning after Ramadan when Fajr is at 4.45 a.m. That's a different group of people. MashaAllah, maybe we've never met that group of people. Let's show up and see who they are, right? And then meet them, grab a box of donuts or dates or whatever the case may be. And, and you know, you start building up these friendships uh, let's go and let's go uh, biking on Saturday mornings, you know, or something like that. And Alhamdulillah, I don't think that's hard. You just have to find a different crowd that's there, and you just, mashallah, people are accepting, people are opening. These are these are relationships we see budding in all masjids, and this time of the year, all masjids have artikaf, all masjids got qiyamul layl. Everywhere you see these amazing relationships being built, and you can go in jamaat, of course. Yeah. You kind of touched on a lot of these. Uh, some people are asking, um, 
when it comes to family in particular. A lot of people culturally are very close with their cousins and people who are non-mahram. So how do you navigate that relationship? Yeah, very good question. So, in the, you know, when we are following our deen, we have to make sure that we protect ourselves to the best of our ability in a respectful manner. If we do a, if we, if, like for example, shaking hands with, your, with a female cousin who is also 25 years old or 19 years old, inappropriate. Being in seclusion, going on a drive with your female cousin of that age, obviously very inappropriate. Okay? But at the same time, for example, food has been served and you're going to make your plate. Right? And all the sisters going, usually sisters going first and brothers or brothers, you know, something like that. If a cousin was like, you know, five, ten years older than you, says, Salaamu Alaikum, you can respond. Even if someone of your same age says, Salaam, who very, was very close, responding on this case, I feel, I mean, of course, the, 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 it's not necessary to respond to the, a non-mahram, especially when there is a, uh, it's not necessary. It's not wajib to respond to a non-mahram. But what I'm saying is that if a person, your aunt, or your uh, yani aunt who you're not, yani your uncle's wife, right? Uh, not your mom's sister or your dad's sister. Uh, says salam. Yes, there is hijab there. But a person who can definitely respond, can have a conversation. So we have to know how to be able to uh, navigate that. Where a person needs to make sure that personally, myself, I'm not going to put in a position where I'm in seclusion, or I'm in khalwa, or I'm doing what something is completely haram. But if someone speaks to me at a distance, like how you would speak to someone outside, right? Uh, you have, there's no way your day goes by through school and you work where you don't have to speak to someone of the opposite gender. But you do it in a respectful, respectful, professional manner. The key thing with all these relationships with the opposite gender is that you have to keep it respectful, you have to keep it professional, and you have to um, basically be reserved in it. It's, uh, you, you don't want to become uh, too free. Because as soon as you like crack a joke, what happens? That, that may be taken as a sign of, you know, thawing of a relationship or uh, making a move or whatever the case may be. And that's exactly what we don't want to show. We want to just basically say cordially, we say salam and hi, bye to everyone, no problem. But when you start making remarks and compliments and jokes, it unnecessarily moves away from a necessary talk to unnecessary and very quickly can even turn to flirtation in relationships outside, real quick, real quick. This is why most youth, they end up in horrible problems because of not taking the first step. For example, those MSAs end up becoming, instead of becoming beneficial, become extremely harmful to the people who are involved in it simply because they did not play within the rules. They didn't play by the rules. They did not put very clear, distinct, um, uh, you know, borders and boundaries between this interaction. You know what, for example, there's a, there's a male and a female a president or, or the co-president, co whatever the case may be. Okay, I understand that there's needs for that. But not to sit there and say, like many times when I go speak, I say, how many, how many youth does it take to, to turn a mic? It takes two, one guy and one girl. Right? <laughs> Literally, they're going, oh, how do we turn this on? Turn? She's standing there, he's standing there, they turn on the mic. Like, really? Come on, who are you fooling? One of you lead and let the other one do it. But no, they continuously put them, so, both of them are holding, one's holding the bottle of water for me, one's holding the bottle for me. Here. <laughs> right? So you, you're fooling yourself, you're not fooling. you know what you're doing, man. So the why, why do we have this close contact discussion and a chit-chat, you know, with the opposite gender? Naturally things are going to happen. And they say, oh, nothing's going to happen. Listen, we're on a very important point. The deen does not dictate based on your immediate, like, uh, lust bar. There's no bar. Oh, if it's this, then it's haram. If it's down below that, it's okay. No. The deen judges us based on external things. There are certain relationships that are halal, certain relationships that are haram. If a person says, I don't feel lust, doesn't make a difference if you feel lust or not. Well, I'm not attracted to her. Doesn't make a difference. I'm not attracted to him. Doesn't make a difference. What's halal is what's halal, what's haram is what's haram. Don't ever think into this thing, oh, I'm not, I'm not attracted. He's, if halal is not about attraction, right? It's not about that. It's about what is clearly demarked as permissible by the deen and which is demarked as impermissible. So to have this um, uh, flirtatious, when an outsider, when an outsider thinks you're being flirtatious, it's over. When an outsider walks in and says, oh, these guys are just way too close. These guys are just too friendly. That's most definitely a major problem. These guys gotta get married, man. You gotta give them away to find somebody. Um, and you can expound more on some of these questions. Um, further, we can ask what you wanna expound yeah. on. Uh, some of these are really specific. 
you know, people are asking what to do if you break somebody off and they get mad and they come and attack you. Probably learn jujitsu, get some mace, something like that, right? Learn how to defend yourself. Um, should you leave those words? I think okay, you touched you know, on you, Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, I was thinking many times some people say that, you know, my family is a big, big problem. My family, uh, they don't really care about, they want to do these events, get togethers at home before their first generation. Mostly the first generation, you know, there would be there would be some lihas, some sort of etiquettes in the house gatherings, but now it's just there's no salah taking place. There's music also. There's guys and girls in all different rooms, you know, young kids just roaming around talking, you know, in, being over friendly. And um, I know, I know I've, I've seen I've received these questions from the community. It's like, wait, I don't want to. I'm not cool with this. Or weddings, of course, weddings with music, with dancing, with you know, all mixed gatherings and all that other stuff. How do you handle that? That's a definitely a, a tough question. It just kind of depends who you are. If you are a 17-year-old listening to this, the way you act with that is differently compared to the godfather of the family who's changing and he wants to change his family. It's completely different. You have to understand your sphere of influence and try to stay within that sphere of influence. You have a sphere of influence of, 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 of two people and you're acting like you have a sphere of influence of 200. You have a sphere of influence of one inch and you're acting like you have a mile. What do I mean by that? that you have to know to what degree do people value your opinions and statements. You have to build street credibilities. You have to build your way up in your khandan, in your family. If a person goes right out and says, this is wrong, this is wrong, wrong, they'll, not only will they make fun of you, Allah forbid, they'll make fun of the deen. So you have to be very careful, dear brothers, young people who are trying to come to the deen. Very important. The way you present the deen is you have to be careful. It's tough, I know, but subhanAllah, ask, we ask Allah for wisdom. But sometimes we may say a statement which actually turn people away from the deen even more. So, for example, when a wedding or an event is happening which un-Islamic things are happening, definitely that's not the time to go and say, shut off the lights, right? Cut the electricity. No, that's gonna cause some major, major problems. If these discussions can happen beforehand. And if, they, if you see that there is absolute resilience and say no, then a person can, uh, you know, just Protect himself from that. Protect himself from that. To say, for example, I'm going to be at the initial part of the wedding. And then, you know, they have the lobbies. Say, okay, you just take a phone call. You just kind of use wisdom hikmah to say, I need to step away from something which is completely haram I can't be a part of. So I'll, I'll, I'll go out to take a phone call with something else that's happening. Right? Or I will uh, busy, hey, you need to get some delivery. We ran out of drinks or you ran out of cakes. I'll go run. I'll go get that. So a person finds a way for him to be uh, away from those type of things. That's the least you should do. When it comes to teaching the family, bringing in, uh, uh, removing, uh, removing cultural haram elements from the wedding is not easy. It's not easy. People who are front row musallis are entrenched in that type of stuff. People who do etika for years are entrenched in that stuff. People who, are, who know the deen, who give khutbahs and buy everything, they're entrenched in that stuff. Astaghfirullah. When you go to their son and daughter's wedding, it's like, what in the world are you doing, man? These are like completely two opposite lifestyles you have. So that's just how it is. So those islah and tarbiyah should be done by the ulama and the imams through their talks and lectures. If we ourselves try to take on that role at home, it may backfire, probably will backfire. So that's why I think when it comes to these major changes, we need to basically be realistic of what change we want to bring. First of all, start off with your immediate family. Like, hey, we gotta start praying. Hey, we gotta start reading Quran. Hey, we gotta start seeking knowledge. Hey, we have to start leading, wearing modest clothing. You know, basic things. And even if that family may end up doing a crazy shadi, for example, I understand that. But we're gonna slowly build our way up. If you go straight for the stuff that is like, oh, everybody is a once in a lifetime, come on. Exactly. So we're not saying it makes her right, but we need to understand who can handle what. I remember one person during the time when Allah Shaitani Rahmatullah, one Hindu, he wanted to accept Islam. And then after that, when he found out, he was like, oh, mashallah, come, come. After a while, he ran away. He didn't accept Islam. So he asked uh, the people in the masjid, what happened? He said, this Hindu came in, he said, I am, I'm all accept Islam, but I'm an alcoholic. I'm addicted to my daru, you know, I have to drink my, my beer and stuff. So they said, the villagers said, Astaghfirullah, this is haram, this is basic, come on man, what is Islam is you don't drink. So he said, if that's the case, then forget it. And he left. So one of the time he got so upset at them. He said, why you did this? You should have brought him in, bit by bit, slowly he would have, inshallah, left it. So the idea is, you know, when you're working with your family, you want to slowly work with them one by one. And try to work first of all with an immediate family and work on fundamental things. 
instead of working on things that maybe are second tier. And if they still disapprove, if they, if they think you're getting too religious, then how do you manage that? Uh, for the basic things? Mm -hmm. There are many people like that. There's so many people who, who pray and their spouse may not pray. Who fast, their fast, fast spouse doesn't fast. For example, and uh, unfortunately, parents. Huh? parents, same thing. So there, of course, there's so many reverts of parents who are not Muslims. So many practicing Muslim boys and girls whose parents don't practice. This, these are the nights for dua. We have to make lots of dua for them. Lots of dua for them. And then somehow or another, just like we work on a friend who's kind of, we're trying to bring him to the deen, we have to figure out, like um, someone said, my dad has this specific habit, what do I do? I said, well, I've addressed it in some of my talks. I said, when you're going for a long drive, make sure you choose that talk, right? Or someone else's talk that speaks on this topic. And organically, let him listen to that scholar speaking on that topic. If you go tell him it's disrespectful and he definitely won't be willing to probably listen to you. But allow him, you know, you know, shoot the gun off of someone else's shoulder. So meaning, let, let someone else do the talking for your parents as well. What is your advice on how to avoid becoming judgmental or developing a superiority complex for somebody who is becoming more religious? MashaAllah. I asked one on a... Um, um, Haji Farooq Ramadullah son. Remember, I don't know, were you there when he was, when the, he was doing... He, was stay, he used to stay in Hazrat Muftiullah Sahib's house, the one from Pakistan. Were you there? When he was staying in Mufti Sahib's house, he was a Khadi Mufti Sahib, he was the one who wrote the Qarat al Dil and everything. I think you know him. I'm forgetting his name. It's Haji Farooq Ramadullah son. So, he was one of the first Ifta students of Darum Zakaria. So I asked this because he was, his father was a very big Sheikh of Tasawwuf in Pakistan. So one day, after coming back to South Africa, I called him up, his son. And I said, you know, I have a question. I get invited to, you know, places, and they, they, they read out my bio, and they may add some new, nice, new, nice compliments of the speaker, which is normal. And then I have to go speak. How do I ensure that the praises of the people before the talk or after the talk do not affect my sincerity and don't get to my head? So he said, before you give any presentation or talk, you should do a meditation, muraqaba, a meditation. And that meditation should be focusing on 10 sins of yours that no one besides Allah knows, that you have done in the past, hopefully not now. And think about those sins before you go up and say, it is only Allah who has covered up my flaws, that's why I'm being invited to speak. And it is only Allah who has covered my faults, that's why people are praising me. Had they known any of these 10 sins, None of this would have happened. So I may be able to fool others, but I should never fool myself. This advice, when I shared with other people, they say, brother, if I were to do that, I'd have to run out of the room. <laughs> they say, I would run out of the room if I were to think about what's in, subhanAllah. But this is the thing we need to always do, is reflect on our own life, past life, and then also see that what we have maybe just simply changed the way we're sinning. It could be that we stopped doing one thing, but we are doing something else. Uh, very well, very likely. So then keep your eyes on those mistakes. And ask Allah, is it tonight after Taraweeh too, like the dua I made, Ya Allah, make us aware of our flaws and mistakes. Allow our eyes to be focused on ourselves. And allow us from one eye to look at our flaws, and with the other eye to look at the strengths of others. That's something I think really important. So cultivating that self-awareness, introspection. So, what is the dua? Allahumma ja'alni fi aini saghira wa fi ayunin nasi kabira. One of the beautiful du'as you'll find in Hizb al-A'zam or Manajat Maqul, Oh Allah, make me insignificant in my eyes and significant in the eyes of others. It's nice to be significant in the eyes of others. Why? Because when you speak about the deen, then they will listen to you. But you should never become significant within your own eyes because then you become self-conceited and down, finish, you lose everything. You know that story of the shaykh who became a shepherd? Yeah. Can you tell that story? Um, yes, yeah, so that was about Abdullah and Dulusi, right? The story is mentioned in books, in Bahr al-Dumu and other books of a shaykh who, went for, he was a great scholar, he was went for hajj, and he was going with his students for hajj, for a long journey. If you see any space in front of you brothers, please move up, please move up, right? Close up the gaps. Jazakumullah khair wa asal khair So, especially the brothers in the back, right? Come, come forward, inshallah. When he, he was going for hajj, and when he was going for hajj, long journey by, you know, by the, through the desert and through various countries, long ago, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, he was going with his murids, his students, his disciples. They arrived in one city, and his, the, 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 the sheikh, after some time said, um, 
you all move on, I'm gonna stay here. He said, what? He said, yeah, I'll catch you all. You guys go, I'm gonna come. He said, you are a sheikh, you're supposed to be in the front. He says, no, 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 I have some business to take care of. So they couldn't believe. He said, well, wait. He said, no, don't wait, you need to go. They started wondering what's going on. And he said, well, I've actually fallen in love with a girl here. I said, who? And subhanAllah, they looked at it and she was a non-Muslim. They couldn't believe like what's going on. And they begged him, this hajj, we're going for hajj. How could you have a non love relationship with a non-mahram, non-Muslim? What are you doing? You know, as respectfully as they could tell him, they tried, but he was not budging. They went, went on to perform hajj. Usually hajj at those days used to take two to three months. They performed hajj and on their, on their way back, they went through the same city. And they look and look and they saw, where is, there, where is the shaykh? And subhanAllah, they saw that he is actually in a very bad state. He had actually now left his old deen and he told them, that, go away from here, go away, go from here. He said, what happened? He says, no, I wanted to marry her, I wanted to marry her. And then the father, father-in-law, who was a Christian, he said, no, I'm not gonna get married, I'll let you get married until you denounce Islam. And then he had, he, he had, he didn't have, he didn't have sheep or cows, he had pigs. He said, I want you to take my pigs for grazing every single day. And you have to basically remove any and all elements of Iman and Islam from your heart before you get my daughter. This is what, when they say love is blinding, this is exactly what it is. A man will do something crazy, crazy, crazy wrong stuff when he becomes blinded by love. SubhanAllah, it's not normal love. This is like shaitan putting steroids on that love. It's something whole messed up thing. It's very dangerous. So many people do so much self-harm and harm to their parents and harm to their family and harm to the deen when they fall into a haram relationship. It's so sad to see young men and women destroy their life because of this so-called nonsens nonsensical you know, crush. So he had this crazy crush. And um, he basically forgot the entire deen, forgot the entire Qur'an. If I remember correctly, the only ayah that remained with him was the ayah of Surah Hadid. Alam amanu an Hasn't the time yet come that your hearts begin to tremble in front of the remembrance of Allah. And in front of that which Allah has revealed from the truth. So this, they began to recite different verses and so forth. This was the only verse that he was able to remember and when he heard it, it hit his heart. And you can imagine the dua of all the disciples in Hajj and on the way back from Hajj. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought back the nur of Iman into his heart. Alhamdulillah, he realized what he was doing wrong and he made tawbah, he repented and he came back. Then they sat and asked him, Shaykh, we just don't understand what happened. This is crazy three months. How did this happen? Like, so he started reflecting and he said, when I entered this village, there were some monks, there were some Christians who were worshipping God in their own Christian manner. And, just, and I looked at them and just this thought crossed my mind that how foolish these people are. How stupid and foolish these people are that they think they're worshipping Allah, they think they're doing right, but they're so wrong. He says, Allah has always punished me for this one act I did, which was to look down upon a non-Muslim, thinking that he, I am somehow superior than him. Because we're not superior to a non-Muslim. We don't know in what state we will die, and we don't know what state they will die in. Only time will tell. So when a person looks down upon another Muslim, you can imagine how, how unbelievably terrible of a sin this is. There's mentioned in hadith that there was two people, if I remember correctly, during the time of Isa alayhi salam. And one of them, one of, oh, actually this, one of them used to tell the other one, his friend, stop sinning. And the other one used to keep on sinning. He was a friend, both friends. One used to tell the other his son, this is a very good example for our night, tonight's gathering. He used to say, stop sinning, aqsir, aqsir, stop it, stop it. And the other guy would say, ah, I'll do it. So one day he got ticked off, right? He got upset. He said, how many times am I gonna tell you to stop sinning and you keep on doing the same thing? You don't change. He says, well, Allah, Allah will never forgive you. Allah will never forgive you. So then the response, Allah Azza wa said, both of you start your deeds again. He said, man yata'alla ala Allah. Who out there is trying to act God? Who out there is trying to act God? Forgiveness is not in the hands of any one of us. It's solely reserved in the hands of Allah. There is no way anyone can say, Wallahi, Allah is not going to forgive you. He got, Allah got so upset at the statement comes in hadith. Allah says, both of you start your book of deeds fresh. 
Oh, oh, the one who was righteous, all your good deeds have been wiped clean. Zero. Instantaneously, all deleted. Allah, who can ask him? He does whatever he wants. And oh, the sinful person, because of this hurtful statement he said to you, all of your sins have been forgiven. Both of you start fresh. So there is absolutely no space in our faith for being judgmental. No space. No space. You will ruin your akhirah. You will ruin your deen if you pass judgments about anyone. Wallahi. This is why I told you the type of sin just changes. Person starts, let, leave one sin, then he starts passing judgment. Well, how did you improve? You close one window, you open the other window. Do not underestimate the deceptive power of shaitan. You think ulama are free from shaitan? They get the bigger of shaitans. But they don't get them into XYZ major sins that maybe other people are involved in. Get them through other things. There's no one here who doesn't have a shaitan after him. And he knows how to get each one differently. So be careful. You might be getting it in a manner you never imagined. And one of the main things is that when we look down upon another Muslim brother or sister, when we look down upon them, it is sufficient to fall from the esteem of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So important, so important. If you're wearing a scarf, don't judge a person who's not wearing a scarf. You're wearing a niqab, don't, wear, don't judge a person who's not wearing it. You are growing out your beard, don't grow, look down upon someone who's in. Astaghfirullah. Right? Someone just told me, Monana Yusuf, someone just told me, Monana told me, MashaAllah, Monana Yusuf bin Nuri, if I remember correctly, was sitting in Qari Abdul Basit Sahab. Qari Abdul Basit was invited for Qiraat. SubhanAllah. So while he's on stage in front of thousands of people in Pakistan, someone wrote a note to Hazrat Monana Yusuf bin Nuri, Rahimahumullah, our grand ustad, and one of the founders of the greatest, one of the greatest madrasas of Pakistan. He said, Hazrat, this person who's Qari, he doesn't have a beard. Mahluq al He's a, this is a fisk, this is a sin. He shaved his beard. He's, he's, you're, you, why are you honoring him? By giving him a chance to leave. So he put him on the spot like this. He said, Mawlana Yusuf bin Nuri responded, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, unka zahir, hamare zahir ki tarah bana de, aur hamara batin, unke batin ki tarah bana de. He said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make his external appearance like our external appearance, and may Allah make the condition of our heart like the condition of his heart. SubhanAllah. What an amazing balanced answer. The fact that just because someone has externally something, that, that does not mean internally he may be light years ahead of us. Right? This is, the, this is what we learn from ulama. Right? But he never said, oh, I just call us what's wrong. Let me just cover it up. What's wrong is wrong. But so he called, he explained it, but he did it in such a beautiful manner. Right? Um, so this is, what, this is some issue that we get. Actually, let me tell you the reverse of this too. There are certain people who may not be following the deen externally, like hijab, jilbab, uh, you know, uh, uh, salah, etc. Mean deen. But then they think anyone who follows the deen is judgmental. Hmm. I've seen that also. So a sister who doesn't wear hijab or scarf, she looks at another sister, mashallah, says, Salaamu Alaikum. She says, oh, this lady, oh my God, I can look at her eyes. I can see it's dripping with hate for me. Oh, no, this is a reflection of your own spiritual problem. You know how many people have told me, Oh brother, if you come to the, uh, you know, I, I, if I come to Dar Islam, people give me dirty looks because I'm not wearing to go to, to, to kufi. I said, well, give me that. I want to, who's that guy? I'm, I'm one of the imams of the masjid. Bring me that person who gave you a dirty look because of how you were dressed. Wallahi, I'll sort him out. Bring me that person who, if you came with tattoos, you came wearing yeah, I mean, long shorts, you came even wearing short shorts. No, no, no short shorts. The person who's going to correct you should be, yani, myself. Or one of us will come and say, Brother, can I talk to you a little privately? And we can go tell him. Right? Some of the brothers said, Shaykh, we don't have, you know, uh, we, we, unfortunately, it's not just the first day of Ramadan, we have moon sighting, we have moon sighting every night here. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I said, okay, man, but you know what? We have to go and you know, basically having their tr trousers, you know, their pants, unfortunately, b b below where they need to be and exposing themselves to the people performing salah behind them. Mooning them. Yes. Exactly, right? So, so this moon sighting is happening. Brother, that's, there's one sunnah, there's one moon sighting is haram. Why and we have to do this moon sighting every single night? So, <laughs> now when it comes to these things, this is the responsibility of the imam in a nice manner to speak to someone. I, I want to make Dar salam, and we hope we all are, making it to be genuinely the most welcoming place, no matter how you're dressed. But if you're saying that someone gave me a dirty look, I want to know who it is. More than likely, it is, honestly, it's your own reflection. Your own thinking that, oh, people are looking at me like that. And I've seen, you know, oh, you, you, these, all these bearded people look at me, give me bad looks. No, you, this, you are being judgmental about others. You're saying they're judgmental, you're being judgmental by saying that. 
Where did you get that from? Yes, if someone tells you on your face something inappropriate, that's one bad apple. That's one bad apple. Why are you taking that and just say all niqabi or all hijabi women, all bearded men, all people who wear topi, they're all like this. Where would you get that from? So we got we to gotta watch out from both. We should not be judgmental and we should not do reverse judgmental as well. Like a person thinking, mean, he's probably judgmental, so I'm going to be judgmental about that. Yeah. You cannot. That's also obviously a major sin to do su'avan and to have bad thoughts about another person. All right, thank you. you All right. So there were quite a few questions that were very specific to your case. If that's your situation, then I suggest you talk to Mufti Saab afterwards or find another scholar. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Um, if you have two more minutes, then uh, maybe we can wrap up with some practical advice. If somebody's trying to implement changes, what are one or two things that you think they should start on first? Um, what are the few things that are going to start from tonight's discussion? Tonight's discussion, right? Yeah. Key thing, find a spiritual buddy. Find at least one person who can help you keep in check. Who can message you to say, hey, I didn't see you at Fajr today. You have to have that. He doesn't have to be the imam of the masjid, doesn't have to be a maulana, doesn't have to be some uncle. Your own friend that you play basketball with. Hey man, I'm gonna come pick you up. That's, that wallahi, this gold. That's what you need. You need to have someone who can hold you, or who can hold you accountable. Come up with a very, um, what I should say, very, not easy, but simple and uh, attainable goal. What is my post Ramadan regiment gonna look like? If you, over, if you go all out, you're going to fail. Say, I'm going to leave this, 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 this. No, you're going to end up doing everything. Person, like same thing for a diet. If a person says, I'm going to leave out everything, I'm just going to be on a liquid. You're not going to last more than two days. You have to be uh, pragmatic about it. So, like for example, measure how much you eat. Right? Don't eat after a certain time. Like basic things. So similarly, we should have a regimen. One thing we should be, Fajr and Isha in the Masjid. Done. There's not anything. I have to pray. One, one brother who I always ref think about, because if I, I see him rebound back from his horrible life, I say, if he rebounded, anyone can rebound. That man was, subhanAllah, zina addict. Like, unbelievable, I've never seen anyone like that. And he, I would never imagine that this could, guy ever come, yani, I had always hoped, but he's like, I'm done. Alhamdulillah, Allah brought him and turned him to, mashallah, an amazing person. So I was speaking to him, and he was telling me, I, no matter, with all my busy, busy life, I never, never, ever miss Fajr and Aisha in the masjid. He said, my example is like a person who still got cancer and I need my chemo. He's like, if I don't get my chemo, I'm done. He said, my Fajr and Aisha is like my medication. I have to be there. He, SubhanAllah, as busy of a schedule he has as a, you know, as a professional. So I think this is something we need to stick with. Fajr and Aisha in the masjid. Have to. You miss one day, two days, okay, if it happens, you miss come up then the next day. Feel guilty about it. Okay, when you have a streak, winning streak, I just talked about it in the other masjid too. When you have a winning streak, reward yourself. Go out, do something you're fun. When you have a losing streak, punish yourself. To say, you know what, I am gonna go do ahtikaf in the masjid. Your, the masjid, the, the, the ishtima that happens, the ishtima happens every week, for example. It's hard, you wanna sleep on the floor, this, that, uh, you know, I don't usually go there, but why I said that? Because there's not that many masjids open for atikaf outside of Ramadan. All right? Yeah, so th that's what I'm trying to say. So if a person says, I'm not going to tell you to go sleep in the car outside of the masjid, but I will say, go find a weekly ishtima that's happening and go say, I'm going to take my bedding and go sleep there. You have to. Pro you have to break the habit. Right? Of course, um, what else? You have your basketball week. You play once a week basketball. You say, okay, I missed three fajrs this week. I'm not playing basketball. You're right. First, uh, okay. So. And so then, uh, what else? So there's got to be carrot and stick for breaking your regiment. There's got to be a carrot and stick. When you do something good, do it. When you're not, if you're not, if you're not, if you are, if you have a continuous non-stop, you're just falling and failing, do something spiritually uplifting. And as, uh, as he said, one of the quickest ways of getting an iman boost is, is jamaat. You know Nu'man Ali Khan, who does not know Nu'man Ali Khan? I remember my, myself and him, we did a presentation together in 2008. Long time ago. So it was on, it was on the whole weekend on Iman, right? It was, it was some different tips of something. I don't know what it was, Tafsir or something like that. So we both were speaking. And then, this was, the questions came in about, like, okay, how do I get an Iman boost? So literally, that's what Ustad Nu'man's answer was. Man, leave out what people say. The quickest way to get an Iman boost is go out in three days or go somewhere. 
right? I've spoken to Sheikh Hamza Yusuf myself on this topic. Whether it's um, Sheikh Suhaib Webb or so many other other converts, subhanAllah, they'll tell you that their first deen they got the first time it was through going out in Jamaat. That's it. They learned their basic stuff. So don't be, when you say, brother, but there's a lot of people who say horrible things about it. Jamaat. Well, brother, there's a bunch, there's more than that are people who say bad things about Islam. Were you sleeping? Well, you don't read, the, you don't live in this world? How many people bad mouth and hate Islam and say the most horrific things and horrible things about Islam? Are you gonna leave Islam? What is that supposed to mean? The people who say bad things, leave them. You are not there for the bad, obviously. You're there for the good. People judge Islam by bad Muslims. Similarly, people will judge this entire effort of da'wah and tabliq by people who are bad apples. If there's a guy who goes, ter terrorizes people or blows up a building, but what am I supposed to do, man? He had a meltdown, he is psychological, he had a bad childhood, he had a rough childhood, he did something. Why are you blaming Islam for that? He happened to be a Muslim. And yes, he happens to use verses of the Quran for that, but it has nothing to do with Islam. Same thing, if a person out goes out in Jamaat, or a person has a beard, or a person has a hijab, or a person has a turban, and he does something wrong, stop throwing everyone under the bus. So for sisters and brothers, I would suggest a weekend or just a one night i'tikaf in the path of Allah Azza no matter what part of the country you are, there's always da'wah work happening in mashallah all parts of the country. Go find, go, go. This is one of the quickest, quickest, um, what you call, way to get yourself out of the mess you're in. For sisters, also spiritual buddy, right? Definitely same thing. Your regimen, obviously Fajr and Aisha in the masjid would not be that. It would be, for example, just simply praying your five times daily salah, not delaying it, praying it on time. Rather, try to pray it earlier part of the time, as soon as time gets in, because we end up then forgetting. So that should be the daily regimen. When, and number two for all of us, both men and women, is um, I try to attend one halaqa, one program in a masjid of your local area once a week. For those in Dar es Salaam, we have our drivable distance an hour away from here. We have a Tuesday night tafsir, happens every single Tuesday, alhamdulillah. Every single Saturday morning, we've got our amazing Team Fajr program with a talk on spirituality followed by breakfast. So Tuesday nights and Saturday mornings. What, online and on site. But on site, if you can drive an hour, it's worth, inshallah, the, the environment that you get here. For those of you in out of state or different parts of this city too, you don't have to only come here. Find a scholar who's conducting a weekly program. That is, all, mashallah, the programs I know of are open to both men and women, whether it's here or anywhere else. So attend those programs at least once a week. And then make sure, number two, we have a regiment of dhikr. This is key. Regiment of dhikr. La ilaha illallah a hundred times. Astaghfirullah a hundred times. Durush Sharif a hundred times. At least this much. You have the Ramadan checklist, right guys? Ramadan checklist. It shouldn't, it's not Ramadan checklist. That's Shawwal checklist too. Right? That's everything checklist. Take that. Cross out Ramadan and write Shawwal on it. And you can remove some of the things that you won't be you know, necessarily continuing. But at least stick to, like Tasbih Fatima. Why should we not do Tasbih 33 times after every Salah? Why? What's the reason for us not to do that? What's the reason for us to not to have 15 minutes of dua every day? These are things you need to stick to even outside of Ramadan. So having a buddy praying for the men to pray Fajr and Isha in the masjid, uh, for the sister to pray the Salah on time, and then to have a daily, uh, to attend a halaqa once a week, and to make sure we do dhikr. Um, and we'll conclude with dhikr now. I have to go to another masjid right now, so we, we, I won't take too much time quickly. And you have support downstairs, I have another program elsewhere. But you, what we can do is like the dhikr we do here for a few minutes. Just do this at home, man. Just do this at home. Do it if you're married, you got kids, do it with your children. If you're, you're a brother here, you can go with your family. Sit and do dhikr for a few minutes. And that dhikr in the house of Allah followed by a short dua, it will really bring a lot of spirituality in your life. Was there anything else you wanted to say? Close your marks. Okay, inshallah. So, um, there is the, for those of you who are seeing us first time or listening to us first time, if you want to know about dhikr, there's a book right there at the booth outside and the bookstore downstairs on the permissibility and the sunnah of doing dhikr in all different forms, as in, in out loud, as well as softly, individually, and collectively. So you can go pick up that book for $6 from downstairs. In the meantime, inshallah, we'll do dhikr for a few minutes. You can do dhikr, um, you know, audibly, or you just focus in your heart, close your eyes, and follow along in your heart. That is also completely fine, inshallah. Um, one of the uh, adhkar that we need to, what we can do,
One of the, one of the, can you switch the lights here, inshallah, brothers? This lights here. One, one of the afkar that we can do is, um, uh, you, you know, there's, as I said, you can do out loud and you can do softly. One of the things is also meditation. So we'll do just real quick because of the interest of time. Real quick, one minute, just to teach you how to do it is to focus, there's many, many different types of meditations. One meditation is just focusing on the mercy of Allah coming on our heart. Another meditation is coming in the nur of Allah coming to heart. Another meditation is a person thinking about Him passing away. And there's so many different meditations. So one of them, we can just do focusing that we're on this blessed night of Ramadan in the, His house for the past many hours. Ya Allah, Your mercy, Your glance of mercy is, is looking at my, Your eyes of mercy are looking at my heart. That's one thing. Number two, after that, you focus on just doing dhikr in your heart. Not moving your lips, not moving your tongue. Just simply your heart saying, Allah, 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 Allah. This also has a very positive, powerful effect on it. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, let us begin with that. I want us to close our eyes and focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And Allah's nur or Allah's nur or Allah's mercy is coming from Allah Azza wa Jal onto our hearts. And as that mercy and that nur comes to our heart, the blackness, the darkness of sin, the darkness of shaitan, the darkness of our evil self is being broken and Allah's mercy and Allah's nur is washing it away. Next, inshallah, let's focus on our heart saying Allah, 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 Allah. In your mind, imagine your heart is beating with Allah, Allah, without again moving your lips or tongue. Keep your, keep your focus as much as you can and stay still and imagine the heart is saying Allah, Allah. Allah accept us, accept our gathering. Oh Allah, accept whatever khair and good was said. Oh Allah, forgive us if any mistakes were made. Oh Allah, if anything good was shared. Oh Allah, make it easier for all of us to put into practice. Allow it to propagate it to others. Oh Allah, all of our brothers and sisters who are here listening. Oh Allah, make it easy for every single one of us after Ramadan to become a better version of ourselves. Oh Allah, make it easy for all of us to find righteous company. Make it easy for all of us to be surrounded by good, power, positive company. Oh Allah, make it easy for all of us to stay away from toxic relationships. Oh Allah, make it easy for all of us to be able to do what it needs to be done in order to propel ourselves into higher degrees of spirituality. Oh Allah, allow us all to make the tough decisions that we need to, Ya Allah, to be able to protect ourselves from falling into your wrath and become deserving of your wrath. Oh Allah, we seek forgiveness from you for all the life of sin that we have that we have led. Oh Allah, we beg you to allow the remaining years of our life to be much, much more better and allow it to be much more 
in line with the teachings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, please turn the direction of our heart away from sin towards righteousness, away from materialism towards <coughs> actions and good deeds, away from the creation towards you. Oh Allah, make us from amongst those who desire paradise, who desire to be with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in paradise, and then who will act in a manner that is consistent with the one who wants to be a true follower of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Oh Allah, allow us to be able to see the truth as the truth and enable us to follow it. Allow us to see falsehood as falsehood and enable us to stay away from it. Oh Allah, we ask you to grant us the level of yaqeen and iman that is required to do what's right. And Allah, grant us a level of fear that will allow us to stay away from sin. Allah, grant us a level of love for you that will inspire us to do good deeds. Oh Allah, grant us true, true, genuine love of Rasulullah that will make us followers of his sunnah in every aspect of our life. Oh Allah, we ask you to remove any and all traces of hypocrisy from our heart, traces of doubt from our heart. O oh Allah, remove any and all traces of ostentation and show from our heart. O oh Allah, remove all grudges from our heart. O oh Allah, all the evil diseases that we have suffered from. Ya Allah, remove them from our heart. O oh Allah, make our hearts qalbu salim, make our hearts clean and pure. O oh Allah, cleanse it, Ya Allah, cleanse it through this barakah of this Ramadan. Cleanse it, Ya Allah, through the Quran that it is being recited. Cleanse it through the dhikr that we're doing. Cleanse it through our du'as. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant all of us pure, clean hearts, Ya Allah, that are protected from the fitan outside. O oh Allah, we ask you to grant us an immunity, Ya Allah, of sorts, that will, Ya Allah, save us from falling into immediately into any and every latest fitna, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask you, Ya Allah, to grant all those who are not married, righteous, pious, loving, caring spouses, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, that will keep them strong in the deen, Ya Allah, that will bring them happiness in this world, Ya Allah. And O oh Allah, those who are previously, who are already married, Ya Allah, bring mahabba and love between them, Ya Allah. Allow husbands and wives together to change for the better, Ya Allah. Allow them to become a mercy for one another, Ya Allah. Allow them to become a coolness of each other's eyes, Ya Allah. Allow them to help each other practice the deen, Ya Allah. And allow all the parents to be able to raise their children into amazing, successful, Ya Allah, God-fearing people, Ya Allah. Allow the parents to raise their children in the most amazing manner, Ya Allah. Inspire the parents, Ya Allah, to teach their children deen and dunya, successful skills for deen and dunya, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, allow our akhlaq with our parents, and akhlaq with the kids, and akhlaq with the spouses to improve, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, oh Allah, whatever khair we've been able to achieve so far, it's only been through you. Ya Allah, you're the same Lord in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. We beg you, we beg you, we beg you to give us tawfiq outside of Ramadan as well, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, all the brothers and sisters who made intentions to remain firm on the deen after Ramadan, make it easier for all of us to fill, fulfill our intentions, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, make it easier for us to fulfill our intentions, Ya Allah. Allow us all to find good mentors in our life, Ya Allah. Allow us to be connected to our local masjids and our local scholars, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask you to allow us all to become the source of happiness for our parents, Ya Allah. Allow us to become a source of bringing deen into our friend circle and into our entire community and our family, Allah. Oh Allah, on this blessed night, we ask you to allow the ummah in its entirety to turn back in repentance, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, whoever is involved in whatever type of major sin on this night and day, we ask you to allow, oh Allah, grant them the ability to turn back to you, Ya Allah. Ability to, to seek your forgiveness, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, have mercy upon our brothers and sisters in Palestine, Ya Allah. And across the globe, wherever they are being killed, Ya Allah, and, 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 and tortured, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, we ask you to grant, grant your special mercy and grant them victory in all their difficulties, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, grant the oppressed ones, wherever they are, victory over the oppressors, Ya Allah. Oh Allah, please remove the oppressors, Ya Allah, wherever they may be, remove the oppressors, Ya Allah. Grant victory to the oppressed ones and failure to the oppressors, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, we ask Ya Allah to grant us all the pain and to grant all of us the feeling of the Ummah, Ya Allah. Grant us empathy for the Ummah, Ya Allah. O oh Allah, make us amongst those who. <clears throat> Ya Allah, make lots and lots of dua, Ya Allah. Make every one of us amongst those who makes lots and lots of personal dua and personal dhikr, Ya Allah. O Allah, whatever addictions and bad habits and haram relationships any one of us may be involved in, O Allah, allow these blessed nights to become a means of gaining the, self, the strength and the discipline and the self-control to be able to move on, Ya Allah. O Allah, give us the self-control to be able to move on, Ya Allah. Give us the self-control to be able to move on, Ya Allah. O Allah, none of this can have happened, can happen without your tawfiq. O Allah, grant all of us the tawfiq, Ya Allah. Protect this madrasa, this masjid, and all the volunteers, staff, and well-wishers, and donors, and martikifin, and musallis, from any and all fitan trials of, that will ruin their dunya or ruin their akhirah, Ya Allah. Grant us all the khair and good Rasulullah Allah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked you of. We seek refuge in you from all the evil that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sought refuge in you from. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamun ala mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Jazakumullah khaira. Inshallah we'll have suhoor downstairs. And then we'll have hizbul a'adham before fajr. Please let's not create an environment of partying. Let's quietly go downstairs, eat. Inshallah come back, do your individual tahajjud and dua. Fajr is going to be in very soon. Please let's not create an environment of just relaxing. You can sleep and relax after fajr inshallah. Tomorrow night also we'll meet at 1, inshallah. And our Khatma Quran is on Monday night, inshallah. Um, Monday night, at, inshallah, after inshallah.